the beginning of the race in three, two, one. Welcome to the Run Your Own Race podcast with Devin Kennedy. I am your host, Devin Kennedy. And I'm Malad Zonur, also known as Malad the Manager. Hey, and we're excited to welcome you all to the start of a journey that we hope will be a guide to motivate, inspire, and propel you to higher heights in whatever race you're running. Now, you're probably wondering, what the heck is Run Your Own Race? And why should I listen to what these guys have to say? Don't worry, I'll be unpacking all those things today as I take you through the origin story of how Run Your Own Race came to be and how, even without knowing it, I have been using its principles throughout my time in high school while studying at Princeton University and through the twists and turns of my professional basketball career that has brought me to this moment on this podcast with you. Hope you enjoy. I can't believe we're here, man. Months and months of conversations and we're finally here. Man, it's exciting. It's the first one. Uh, we've talked about this now for probably months on end, honestly, probably since last year, uh, something we wanted to do, but we're here, man. It's exciting. I mean, I always, I always subscribe to the idea that you were a storyteller. I think a lot of athletes are storytellers. Finding the right medium to do it is, is one challenge, but I think we're here. We got the hardest part out of the way. We're getting started. Facts. Let's, let's tell these stories. Let's motivate and inspire. That's what we're here to do. Run your own race. I'm, I'm glad to have you on the podcast with me to, to share some stories, listen to some stories. I think there's a lot of value that can be uh, had to kids, to adults, people that are involved in sports, people in any different you know, walk of life. I think it's going to be really special. Absolutely, man. I mean, I think when we first set out on this journey, it was the two words that we thought about were motivate and inspire. And if you can, if you could reach the masses, if you could tell as many people's stories as possible, then you're, then you're going to find a way to accomplish that goal one way or the other. For sure. You know, I, I think, um, you know, I think we always talk about stories, but, you know, for, for episode one or the prelude or whatever we want to end up calling this, uh, maybe the best story to start with is your story. Let's do it the original run your own race story. So, you know, I think uh, as we go through these conversations, it's always a good, good idea to get a landscape of what those early days look like. You know, we know, we know a little bit about Mishawaka, but we want to know everything from day one all the way to today, August 15th. So give us a little bit of insight into what those early days in, in the Midwest were like. Yeah, I think that's probably the best way to go about this is really unpack where I came from, you know, how my upbringing was. Uh, obviously, you know, people probably know that I went to Princeton, but probably don't know a lot about my time at Princeton, you know, uh, and then obviously the journey to the league. So no better place to start than where, you know, my, my roots back in a small town, northern Indiana, Mishawaka, Indiana, to be exact. Uh, I mean, I grew up, there really wasn't much to do other than play sports, my parents made sure I was in sports at an early age. Uh, the biggest reason, you know, being the first born of two young parents. My mom was 20. My dad was 24 when they had me. Uh, my dad had been playing college basketball at a local NAIA school called Bethel College. And, you know, at the time, I forget what kind of like religious um, affiliation Bethel had, but it was something where if you had a baby outside of marriage, um, I mean, that was like a quick way to get expelled from campus. And so I don't know kind of how the ins and outs of that work, but when they had me, he had to stop playing college basketball. Um, and they were just two young people in love that just had a baby boy, you know, that they had to take care of. And so a lot of energy, a lot of time was put into them both raising me, uh, really with the help of my grandma on my mom's side uh, to make sure I had everything that I needed. And so at a young age, one of the ways that my dad probably knew, you know, how to look after a kid and continue to do what he loved was to have me around the game of basketball. So for him, I remember, and there's pictures, videos, um, I'm in a stroller, could barely walk, had a basketball in my hand, and he's playing these three-on-three -three outdoor tournaments. So I was around the game at an early, 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 early age. Um, That's one of my, like, actual – first memories of basketball. Um, I mean, my dad would play VHS tapes. I'm talking about like consistently, constantly. It wasn't just a little basketball here and there. It was all the time, right? So I had VHS tapes uh, playing of Michael Jordan. Um, we had a hoop hanging up in our, in our basement. He'd be lifting me up to dunk at an early age. We're having shooting competitions as I get older. And then, then came my sister, then came my first brother, Dylan. Um, and then came the last, you know, baby of the family, Derek. Um, so I have three younger siblings and I mean, 
shout out to them because again, being the first, being the oldest, and now being involved in basketball, involved in sports, they're constantly coming to all of my events. And they've literally been doing that <laughs> their whole life. So it's been crazy. My life has definitely revolved around the game, but also family. Yeah, I mean, I had the pleasure of meeting your, your, your grandparents and your mom and, and all your siblings when we were out in Indiana. Tell me a little bit more about your grandma, because when I was there, I got the sense that she's kind of like the hub, right? She's like the, 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 the center of, of everything that happens in that family. Tell me a little bit about like your time with her when you were a little bit younger. Yeah, I think that will start with just kind of like, again, small town. Uh, I mean, Mitchell is actually bigger than most people realize. I mean, there's some small towns in Indiana, people from L.A., people from New York. You know, anytime you just say Indiana in general, it's like, oh, you live on a cornfield. It's like, no, like it's actually some, some people that live in Mishawaka. But as it relates to my grandma, where my family, our family, the like home that we all grew up in, uh, her house was probably a little over a mile away. You had to kind of go through different neighborhoods to get there. So it was one of those things where if my mom was working, my dad's working, you're at, you're at ma'am's house. So we call our grandma ma'am and we just, you go to ma'am's house. And when I'm like middle school is one of those things where if I'm hungry and we have no food in the cabinet, I'm about to run to ma'am's literally for some sandwiches <laughs> to hang out with, with grandma. So, you know, she's definitely been like a, a key piece, just kind of like to my family's, you know, ignition, you know, constantly there to love and support um, someone that's very dependable. You, know, you can always reach her. It's just like anyone's, you know, grandma, grandparents, like they just have a, a soft spot for their grandkids. And so, you know, again, me being the first born, pretty, I'm pretty sure, yeah, her first grandchild, I got so much love, so much attention. So uh, it was one of those things where it was a blessing to have someone, you know, that important close to you uh, in like the distance wise. So you know, we've always had that bond. I'm pretty sure she's trying to come down here to Orlando so she can make me some sandwiches. Yeah, I, I definitely, you know, I think in, in a lot of our families, grandma is definitely the cornerstone, you know. So tell me a little bit more about like your siblings, you know, Dylan, Derek, Delena. I mean, they're with you everywhere. They're with you in Orlando. They're with you in Indiana. They're with you in New York. They're with you in L.A. Tell me more about like their impact, because obviously family's important. Mams is important, but they're important, too. Yeah, no, that's for sure. I think for me. The biggest thing for me uh, and all my siblings are unique, they're special in their own ways. You know, just like any family, when you have siblings, you don't love one sibling more than the other. Like I love each and every one pretty much equal. You know what I'm saying? Like they are, are special in their own way. My sister, she's currently in college at Ball State. She's really the backbone of the family. She's the only girl with three boys. So for her, like she's been around three brothers her whole life like she has some shit to her game you know what i'm saying like she doesn't just sit here and just oh you know she's strong independent smart she has all these things going for her uh and so for me being a big brother it's like how can you put the next one in line how can you put them in a position to be successful um and so i just try and give her as much knowledge um kind of keys to the roadmap you know that i've experienced um but she does things in her own way and she's you know um, someone that, again, it's probably been, if you have to say, in a shadow of a sibling, like, as I was going through high school and she's in the Catholic school system, you know, back home, it was like Devin Kennedy, star quarterback, Devin Kennedy, star point guard, like charismatic, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, people love him in the city and it's like, oh, are you, are you Devin's little sister? Are you Devin's little sister? And once I went to college and my family moved to Indianapolis, a big part of that was like, Delena needs her own thing. Like she go, she would have been to Marion the year I would have went to Princeton. And it's like, oh, your dad, we had your brother in class. Oh, you know, yeah, Devin was so good at this. And it's like, well, she needs her own identity. And she found that down in Indianapolis at the high school she went to. She has a great friend group um, and is doing her own thing right now in college. So, um, you know, that's just a, me, me shouting her out and giving her some love. Um, same goes for my brother, Dylan. Uh, you know, he ended up having to go to a couple high schools along his journey. We talk about running your own race. A lot of this has been inspired from and by Dylan and me observing him and how his path has been a little different than the other siblings. So, like, I didn't just make this idea of run your own race. And I, didn't, I don't just 
believe in the principles of running on race because of me solely. It's really observing people in my life. And Dylan is one of the key factors. He's my right hand man. Like we talk about dependability. It's like Dylan, Dylan dependability. Like this, that's him. You know what I'm saying? I can always look out, look to him uh, to get things done. Uh, I had a court ceremony, you know, back home, which we can get into, uh, you know, where I unveiled a court, basically the court I grew up playing on back home. And Dylan was the person right next to me holding the second pair of biggest, you know, scissors because it's like, dude, this is, this is you, like your, your DNA is in this, right? I played basketball and you didn't necessarily, but your impact, in my opinion, in my life is just as, as valuable. And then you have the youngest, Derek, who in theory would be following in my footsteps, playing high school basketball. Um, he's looked at as I think one of the best guards in the state in his class. Um, he's solid. I mean, I think he's better than I was at that time. Um, and so for him, it's like, as I'm going along my journey uh, in high school, there's a video of me shooting free throws on like a televised game back home. And Derek was sitting, there was like a crowd in the background. He's sitting on the floor, just intently watching me. And it was like, I went back and watched the video and I'm like, you never know who's watching. You, I mean, it's your younger brother. And there are going to be kids out here that are just as enthralled and like, man, I want to be whatever. But it's like, that's my little brother probably like, this is my big brother. You know what I'm saying? I want to be like him. And so as I go along the process, it's like, how can I continue to be someone of high character? How can I continue to be someone that not only my younger brother, but, you know, other kids out here can look up to by the way I go about my business, by the way I carry myself, by the way I play. And so he's now a state champion. I think today, right now, as we speak, he's had, he has his ring, ring ceremony um, down at Cathedral. And so for him, I'm like, dude, you have the blueprint. You have the keys. It's now up to you. How hard do you want to work? How much you know, love do you have for this game? How much energy are you going to put into it? Because if I can make it, you sure as hell can make it. You know what I'm saying? If I had a brother who was 10 years older than me and I could just watch and study him, forget about it. You know what I'm saying? It's like Steph and Seth Curry. So that's my family, uh, a, a big part of my DNA and, and how I go about my business and why I do things uh, really is for those three, as well as my mom, as well as my dad. Um, but, you know, even going to Princeton, when they talk about, you know, why do you make decisions that, you know, you have a chance to play college basketball at more known basketball schools? Um, I was thinking the long game where it was like, these are four years, but how's it going to affect your 40 years? You know, how's it going to affect your future generation? How's it going to affect your kids, your kids' kids? I'm also like, how's it going to affect my siblings? You know, I'm not there in person to be present, but I'm going to be. 800 miles from home, busting my ass, literally just working my tail off to get to the next level, to, to, to learn new things, to grow as a man, to get an Ivy League degree. How's that going to set my siblings up just from the network and the connections uh, and just the experience being out there? That's a big reason why I chose Princeton. Yeah. So, I mean, that's one thing that I always, you know, I think a lot of people get a lot of value from. What was that experience like going through high school, that decision to kind of like go with basketball more than football. Right. But also that decision to go to Princeton, like how did that all kind of play out? Yeah. My whole life I played multiple sports. I played baseball until like I was 12 years old. Then it got too slow. Got a little too boring for me. Uh, I'm always, you know, moving, want to do something, you know? And so being in the outfield, I'm allergic to like certain types of grass. So when I was playing uh, baseball in the spring, I'd have the worst allergies. And so literally like, Every time where I feel like I'd be on the injured list and it would say allergies. So I was like, I'm not going to do all this outside in the spring. You know, flowers are blooming. I literally am itching my eyes, sneezing everywhere. I'm not doing that. I'll go to the gym and shoot jump shots. So I stopped playing baseball then. But uh, going into high school when I chose, my family chose to go, you know, enroll me into Marion, um, I was definitely going to stick it out with football. I didn't really know. I didn't think at the time I was going to be an NBA player. I didn't know if I'd be an NFL player. I just knew I loved both football and basketball. Um, I was good at both, but I never really had one that I was really, you know, ahead of the other. So high school, played football. I was the only freshman on varsity for basketball. We went to semi-state. I was a key contributor, probably sixth man on the team. Thought I probably should be starting, which is really just the MO of, most of my career but like at the time was like okay 
cool. Like, good at both. Sophomore year, I'm going to go and play travel basketball. I'm going to get ready for football in the fall. And I played football all four years. I ended up being two-time All-State quarterback. Like, it was something more so than trying to get to the next level. It was the camaraderie, being playing under the lights on Friday nights with your brothers. I mean, you're walking the halls with these dudes. Like, if in high school, like, your boys, like, you're, like, rock solid best friends and in football you're out there sweating doing two a days hitting people getting injured like it's really war out there and for me putting on that helmet it made you feel like a gladiator like a warrior um and i there's one of the one of those feelings that you just knew you weren't going to get really ever again unless you went to the army which i wasn't going to do so i'm like yo i'm about to play football i'm gonna rock it out here with my teammates try and win a state championship uh we obviously we didn't you know, answer that call, but I loved every minute of it, but it was really going to that senior year. I was getting looked at by the Michigans, the Purdue's. I was getting looked at. I went to a visit for Tennessee. Boston college was calling. Uh, so I really thought, man, if I don't play football, I put more time into basketball. Could I get these high major offers by putting more work in? Will they come either way? That's really what my mindset was, was I'm, if I'm good, I believe I'm good enough. I think I can shoot better than most people in the country. I think these schools should offer me. There's no reason why they shouldn't just happened that they never did. So that was really it. I mean, played both. I have no regrets. I'm so glad that I stuck it out, you know, playing, playing football, playing basketball. Um, but that senior year in basketball, it's really when I committed to Princeton. Uh, I didn't know going into senior year anything about Princeton University. I knew nothing about the Ivy League literally until they started recruiting me. Um, I was still wrapped around the fact that a Michigan, a Purdue, Notre Dame would have offered me. Uh, but once that reality kind of sunk in that all these high majors like labeled me as a mid-major guy, I had to kind of switch my thinking to the longevity aspect. And for me, it was like, I, I, I'm probably so psychotically um, – let me, let me rephrase that. I think for me, I have such an unwavering belief in what I can do and what I can accomplish when I set my mind to something. And so I was like, why would I go to, and no offense, why would I go to an IUPY or a Valparaiso when I can get a, the best college degree in the world, in the, in the United States of America at Princeton, but still double down, triple down on myself and my belief that I can make it to the NBA. So I said, I'm going to make it wherever I go. I might as well. And I know I'm probably going to stay four years. Like I'm not the type, if I'm not going high major, I'm probably not the type that's one and done, two and done, three and done. So I might as, if I'm going to get a degree from anywhere, I might as well get it from Princeton. And that was really the mindset, obviously the idea that if I do accomplish that, you know, it's going to set you up in a different kind of atmosphere, outside of basketball when it's all said and done. Um, so I was like, look, I'm going to go out to Princeton, something I know nothing about, um, except that they have presidents and, you know, some of the basketball players now are working jobs at, you know, millions of dollars outside of basketball. I was like, okay, you know, there's definitely going to be a day when the ball stops bouncing. So until that happens, I'm going to put all my chips in on me. I'm going to go to Princeton. I'm going to ball out. And I'm going to go to the league. Um, hindsight 2020. Clearly it was 2020 then because I got my degree and I'm here in the NBA. So that's really this, this journey, you know, playing both sports, not knowing, being overlooked, you know, undervalued, uh, but still just having this belief that I can get shit done when I set my mind to it. Uh, went out to Princeton, balled out, had some struggles, but at the end of the day, made it here. Uh, so I look back and I'm like, wow, I'm very proud of myself. I'm thankful for having people in my corner, in my circle to believe in me to make that decision. Yeah. I mean, I think in life things transpire that you don't foresee, but it's all about how you respond to them. Right. You know, Prin the Princeton experience happens uh, with you going out there, you be, you're in the record books, you lead them to, uh, t you know, to a uh, inaugural conference victory, you break a bunch of records and then draft night comes. What happens after that? Well, I'll say this. At Princeton, let's because I don't want to I don't want to just like skirt past Princeton because that was a very transformative time in my life. Um, from the outside looking in, or the inside looking out, whichever way you want to look at it. Either way, it's fine. Say it again. 
Either way is fine. Either way is fine. Either way. Um, that was a very, very unique time in my life. It's four years, you go from being an 18-year-old to a 22-year-old. It's very formative. I mean, it's like you go from a kid who thinks, you know, your shit doesn't stink. I was the best player in my state pretty much. Um, you know, you're going to a school where you believe I should start day one because it's Princeton. It's Princeton. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. if I can't start at Princeton, why am I playing basketball? Right. That's what my mindset was. And I watched, after I committed, I watched a game. It was on ESPN. My uncle, I was at his house. We're like, yo, it's Princeton, Harvard. It's ESPN. Like, this is prime time. It's like Michigan, Michigan State. It's, this is it. Duke, Carolina. It's Princeton, Harvard. Like, let's see what I'm going to get myself into. And him and I looked at each other pretty much probably at halftime. And we were like, you're about to go there and kill. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I remember that game vividly. It was, it was very slow. It was very methodical. It was very, this isn't here. Let me dribble. Let me pass. And I'm very, like, fun, very fundamental. Very fundamental. Um, I'll just say at the time, and this is an 18-year-old me. Remember I said my, thinking my shit doesn't stink. I have a whole different perspective on it now. But at the time, it's like, I'm going in. I'm going to kill. Like, where's anybody making some plays? Like, where are people who coming down and just letting it fly? Like, I can do that. And I got recruited. And I remember the coach calling my mom, my, myself, and, and my, one of my trainers. And he can, he can attest to this. He put his life on it. He's like, we're recruiting Devin Kennedy. We're recruiting your son, Mrs. Kennedy. We're recruiting him to be different. We're recruiting him because no one that we have, no one that we've ever had, <laughs> does what he does. He plays with a joy. He plays with an energy. He can shoot the ball. So we're recruiting him to be different. So I'm watching the game at my uncle's house, and I'm just trying to paint this picture of the growth. Because, again, I said my experience there was unique. Um, it was formative um, in ways I never imagined. Um, because at the time, I was like, I'm going to go there and kill. All right. Fast forward to your first day of practice. Uh, I still have the same mindset. I remember it's like after all the summer training and we're really at practice now, it's like getting ready for the season. And I remember being on the baseline and, and, you know, coaches talking and I'm, I'm just kind of like, bro, like this doesn't matter. Like, let's just play. Like in my head, I'm like, and so that's what my body language showed. And he's like, he looks over. He's like, Hey, Hey, Hey. No one, no one, no one. No one. <laughs> I can't even think of what he said right now. Basically, it was just like, he's like, who the, who the fuck do you think you are? Like, like, you're not the prince of Princeton. Like, you aren't him. You're not that guy. Basically, it was like, you're not that guy, pal. Um, and it was like, you humble yourself. Like, we're trying to teach you something. It's very, like, I'm, not, I'm probably going to get emotional talking about this part because, like, now I'm putting myself back into memories I never actually think of. And, you know, at the time I'm a freshman and I'm like, I don't know any, I don't know anything. I just know what I know. And I don't know what I don't know, but coach Carrill, Pete Carrill was sitting on the side. He was at 95% of our practices and he's sitting over there. And, and, and I had met him on my college visit. I didn't know who Pete Carrill was at the time. And then he's like, he's like, you know, Hey coach, you know, you know, what, what do you do? Like, you know, why should I know who you are? And he just points to, to the court. Oh, Pete Carrill court. He's like, he points up there to the, to the banner. Oh, Jesus Christ. Like, you're that guy. You are that guy. Um, and he's like, no, you have potential. Like, you can play. You've got to have this and this match up. You know, you like to do all these things. Like, work, defend. Like, can you play defense? I'm like, yeah. He's like, that's what they all say. And so he's like giving you these, these gems. Charisms. Yeah. Yeah. He's giving you these charisms. And I'm putting myself back in that practice. He's sitting over there, go through practice, whatever. I'm probably like, man, this is some BS. Like, you know, why is he calling me out? Coach Grill pulls me over to the side again. Uh, and he's just giving me this wisdom. Like, you know, he pretty much created the Princeton offense. 
And, and what my head coach at the time was saying is like, humble yourself because this is so much bigger than you. Like, yeah, you can play, but can you play in a system? You know, when your teammate dribbles at you, are you trying to just come and get it and pull up a three? Or are you going to back cut and, and not just cut, but cut to space to create an opportunity and an advantage for your teammate? Um, it's crazy now looking back at it. And I had a great career, um, fifth all time leading scorer, third all time, three points. Like, you know what I'm saying? I had an opportunity probably to be number two and number one in those categories, had my career and my senior year specifically uh, gone as planned. Um, had I played all, all games, had I not left school, left the team early, you know, dealing with a lot of, you know, mental health stuff, depression, anxiety, real things. Uh, and that's why I say it's, it was definitely a unique experience because it's things that you just don't anticipate happening. Um, but one thing I can take away outside of feeling like I probably was put in a box and that once I bought into that system, there wasn't the, the reciprocated belief from my coaching staff that, hey, like we have a guy that's special. Like we have a guy who's clearly in the NBA for a reason uh, and like expanding that box and almost like letting me, you know, my buy in actually transforming it to where, hey, like we have this. It's not going to come around too often, <laughs> probably like let's really let's fire on all cylinders. It, it felt like I was continuously pushing that box, trying to break out. Um, it, it honestly was led to a lot of the mental health stuff that I've, I faced at that time, uh, which is why the kind of relationship and probably why I don't think about these things too often uh, because of the, you know what I'm saying? Like the real emotions that were tied up in it. But looking back at the player I am now, the advice I got from coach Kirill, who happened to pass away today as we're doing this podcast. Um, so rest in peace, coach. Like, thank you, coach Kirill. All right. Like for, really helped me along the journey, believing me, uh, humbling me, you know, the, all those things, like that's really special. Um, but like, I take a lot of those things with me and how I play today. You play in the G league, the G league is meant to get to the NBA. No one wants to be in the G league. Um, and I've been in there for three seasons, more or less. Um, after Princeton, a lot of the guys one-on-one, -on -one, like I got to score 40 to get to the league. And I never, I never, I don't think one game played that way. It was like, look, I think I, I can play an NBA role. It's having good energy. It's when you go from defense to offense, sprinting to the corner. When someone dribbles at you, don't try and come get it and go one-on-one, -on -one, back cut. And don't just back cut, back cut out to help your, your player. Like, I learned those things by, by humbling myself at Princeton. Um, and I'll, I'll give a lot of that to Coach Carrillo because he created the system, right? Like, I learned his system. I, I, I wasn't coached by him. I was coached by someone that played under Coach Carrillo. Um, so inadvertently, you know, I learned a lot of the things that he was teaching. And I, I really believe I carry those things here with me and at the NBA level throughout my whole professional journey um, and will continue to do so. I just put a tweet out where it's like, I will continue and carry on your legacy. Um, in every NBA gym that I walk in, I play in, you know, you'll, you'll see a little bit of what you created. So it's, it's crazy. And I didn't expect that. Again, I thought I was a kid with hot shit at 18 and now I'm 26. I'm looking back and it's like, wow, you know what I'm saying? Like probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for those experiences. So this is kind of all gets back to run your own race and the things we talk about, right? Like you don't know what you don't know. Um, you're in these, these situations where you have decisions that you have to make either, you know, you, you kind of humble yourself and say, Hey, I'm in this spot for a reason. If I wanted to be showboating and letting things go, I would have probably played in the Mac. I chose Princeton, a whole different Avenue. The last person to play in the NBA from Princeton was like 2002, Steve Goodrich. Um, and so, yeah, it's like buying into being in the moment and it's something I, I struggled with. And you talked about draft night. We can get back to that, but you know, it's uh, like, I, I mean, I think a lot of these things are incredibly important. I mean, first and foremost, you know, uh, thank you to Coach Krill. You know, condolences to his family. I think um, I think you bring up a good point, right? Humbling yourself is a big part of running your own race. Has there been a moment since you've been in the league, not to skip over draft night, but since you've been in the league, since you've been in the G League, that you felt like you had to re-humble yourself? I mean, being present is, is all about regrounding yourself and, 
And if you ever step too far off of your own lane, you got to kind of bring yourself back. Have you, have you had an experience like that? Since being I would in- say, nah, here's the thing. And it, this is like perfectly bring this back to draft night. Cause once I left Princeton and when I was dealing with the like real heavy, heavy anxiety of what's the next step going to look like, like, I'm in my senior year in the first eight or so games before we played Duke my senior year, it's top 20 in the nation in scoring. I was leading the nation in three pointers made. I'm pretty sure. And percentage, it was something crazy. I was making like five threes a game shooting 50%. I was like in a zone. And then it was really the Duke game. We're up against Zion. We're up against Cam Reddish, up against RJ Barrett, Trey Jones. Like it's the, their squad. It's Zion. You know what I'm saying? Like everyone looked at him. And I looked at it like, well, it's David versus Goliath. You know, Steph Curry played against Duke. He went off. Steph Curry got drafted. Steph Curry went on in the tournament. Like, my mindset was, I have to do so well this game. I have to perform like a freaking NBA all-star this game. Or else I'm not going to make it. Because all the odds are against me. All the odds my whole life have been against me. So this is my David versus Goliath moment. I've got a ball out on the biggest stage. Or else I don't know what's going to happen. And I went, it's like two for 11. I had eight points, three for 11. I had eight points. I shit the bed. You know, you can make excuses. You can do whatever. But it's like, I, I feel like that was the moment. And then every, like my, my dreams were just like fading away from me. And I, I got so deep into my own head. I was questioning. I was like, I don't see how I'm going to get to where I need to get to. Pressed. And so for me, as I went through the next couple of months, really trying to not knowing what depression and what anxiety was, was facing it head on without actually seeing it. And it hit me hard one day to where it was the point where I was like, I can't continue this season. I can't continue trying to write a senior thesis. Like I got to go home. And I, it was a t- one of the toughest, like one of the toughest times in my life. I got injured that because it was mental. It was like, you, you break your ankle or you, you know, tear whatever. Like, you know the process. When it's your mind and you don't know the roadmap on how to get out of that shit, like, that was the, one of the worst times of my life, right? And so as I was picking myself back up, I was home with my family. Um, you know, I, I connected with one of, like, the local legends back in South Bend, Cedric Moody, who was should have probably been in the NBA during his time. Uh, we're connecting, and we're just, like, re re-loving the game like I'm learning how to love the game from a different lens like he's like yeah I probably could have been in the league I wasn't and and he kind of gave me stories on how he approached it in a healthy way and how he approached it in a not so healthy way and he's like here's what you don't do right and so as I was learning that it's getting closer to draft night I sign with an agency I'm doing pre-draft stuff I'm in NBA facilities less than three months after the whole Princeton incident and I'm like I'm working out for the Nets, the Thunder, the Pacers, like the Bucks. I'm watching Giannis work out. I was just at Princeton, down and out. Like, like let's let's be extremely present in this moment. I'm I'm learning these things, and I'm you know, for the past three four years, it was something that it's been a daily check in. Like, okay, like are we are we centered? Are we grounded? Um, but draft night came, had a party. Uh, Demetrius Jackson, one of my teammates in high school, who got drafted to the Celtics, was there. Jaden Ivey, who just got drafted fifth to the Pistons, was there. My family's there. And pick one happens, Zion. Pick two happens, Ja. Pick three, four, five, sixty happens, no Devin Kennedy. By that time, everyone had already left because the draft goes to like midnight. And so I'm like, damn, I had a hope that I could have got drafted. And it's like, damn, you're undrafted. Like forever stamped in time. Like you won't get drafted now like you, you're undrafted like one through 60 happened and they believed whoever believed that there's 60 people more deserving or better than you and I was like that was the moment for me where three six months ago my whole life I, I would use that as fire but, but like fire that was probably unhealthy it was like I'm gonna still go get it but for me I was like man this is this is empowering like I can own that I was undrafted. Like I get to be undrafted. I'm undrafted and I have a story that's yet to be written. And right now in this moment, here's where we're at. 
An hour later, my agent called, hey, okay, see, the Thunder want to sign you to Summer League. Um, and I was like, I, I wanted to put out a tweet. And I was like, man, could I put out a tweet? Like, man, y'all, y'all are going to regret this. Let's go Thunder. I was like, nah. I was like, you know what? Thank you, Thunder organization, for the opportunity. And then I put hashtag run your own race with this with which I would put as in the in the in the uh, what's it called emojis it was like the feet and a checker flag and this is where I came up with this the run your own race what I call it the finish line feet because like every step you take that's the start of my professional journey and every step is leading to a end goal a finish line this is how this is me running my own race I didn't think it was going to be my life slogan. I didn't think it was going to be a brand. I didn't think I was going to make a company after it. But in that moment, I was like, man, undrafted, have an opportunity to go to summer league. Man, shout out to Zion. Shout out to Ja. Like, I'm happy for you guys. And so the other thousand, hundred, whatever, undrafted dudes, I'm happy for you too. Because guess what? I'm going to still get to where I need to get to. I'm running my own race. Run your own race. You know what I'm saying? And that was the moment. And so you talk about humbling yourself. Like it was getting going undrafted where I was like, all right, let's check, put our pride to the side, check our ego at the door. I'm here for it. And that's when I started running your own race. Ever since then, I think I've had a very healthy look at setbacks, a healthy, a healthy view of, um, you know what I'm saying? Like quote unquote failures. And I looked at these things as like, this is, this is part of my journey, man. Like, we're going to keep going. Whether I make it to the league or not, we're going to keep going. Whatever is in front of me, whatever the next opportunity, it's exactly where I'm supposed to be. God has a plan for me. I'm going to do my part. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to put the work in. Show me where I need to be. Put me where I need to be. I'm going to be 100% locked in, faithful, committed. I'm going to keep going. That's what's on the back of this shirt. You know what I'm saying? We might put the put the shirt in the description. You can go buy it. You know what I'm saying? But like at the end of the day, like that was the moment ever since then. I've had plenty of opportunities to question my journey. But that was the moment where I was like, all right, let's let's do this. Yeah. The uh, the humbling moment led to the the big realization, the beginning of the RYOR. Not even it's not even a brand, it's the lifestyle, it's the mantra. It it's is. the ethos. So 2019, 2020, obviously a weird year for, or a weird season for the, for the entire league and every other sports entity and the world as we know it. What was that experience like kind of coming in? You went undrafted. You had the OKC experience, which you shouldn't gloss over. Uh, then you, that led you to Brooklyn. Um, and then obviously COVID happens. What's, what's going through your mind? That year, I feel like that year for everybody was – I mean, everything was uncertain. <laughs> like, there was no certainty that anybody could have other than the only th certain thing was uncertainty. And um, I forget, it's like a, a meme or something uh, where, I mean, once COVID hit and they were like, these are unprecedented times. And it was like, we all miss precedented times. Like, we all want just the status quo where we have some certainty. Like, I'm going to go to work. I'm going to get my coffee. I'm going to drive down this street. My boss is going to yell at me. I'm gonna go back home. Like that was that certainty. That's precedented times. And this was like, hey, like, nah. Like Devin Kennedy, I was getting calls potentially getting a 10 day. Like I was in a position where I could have probably got a 10 day at the end of my first season in Long Island, uh, you know, from a handful of teams. But it was like COVID hit. And I was balling the last five games of the season. In the last game that I played in, I was like nine for nine at the rim. I think this year in Orlando, I didn't make a single two-point shot. Like, I was just in a different flow. You know what I'm saying? And there's reasons why I didn't. Coming back from the injury, like, I definitely will be at the rim making plays this season. You know what I'm saying? A lot more twos. A lot of threes are going to go in. But at the time, it was like, yo, there, yeah, I, I'm in a flow. And then COVID hit. And so, for me, oh, geez, I'm almost missing the biggest part of the story. Okay, dude, 20, 2019, 2020, I'm in Vegas, Summer League, OKC, I play, and then it's like, I don't know what's going to happen next. I told my agent, he's like, hey, you know, we're going to hit up some teams from Spain. I was like, dude, I'm not going overseas. I'm going to play in the G League. Like, I, I have a plan. I have a mission. My goal is not to play overseas. My goal is to play in the NBA. But the other goal I set out back when I committed to Princeton University was get my degree. 
I didn't go three and a half years to not have that piece of paper. Like, like it was going to happen one way or another. And I told my agent, look, there's probably three teams, four teams, maybe that could work. The Delaware blue coats close to Princeton, uh, the Westchester Knicks close to Princeton. I would even go as far as say the freaking capital city go, go. Like I'm taking the train Amtrak in and out if I need to. Yeah. yeah. Like, bro, I'm playing in the G league. Put me on this team. And I said, but the best opportunity, I said, the best situation would be the Long Island Nets. I said, that's that's the NJ Transit to the LIRR. I can make that trip if I need to. But I said, regardless, I'm enrolling back in school. September 11th, my mom's birthday. I put a little video out on a, I, it was an IG story. I was like, mom, I'm back on campus. I'm here to get my degree. You know what I'm saying? Happy birthday. And at the time, I had no workouts for teams. I had not heard if I was going to play for whatever G League team. So I was just back at Princeton, sitting in the front row of Eddie Gloud, CNN. I mean, he's he's on all the big time stations. He's one of the dopest professors I had at Princeton, Eddie Gloud. Shout out the boy. And I'm writing my senior thesis. I wish I had a physical copy here to, to like hold up. But I wrote my senior thesis on the double consciousness and the presentation of black basketball players on social media. Because at the time, it's like, all right, there's a lot going on in the world. Um, and I was always curious about, like, how do black athletes, black basketball players, professional athletes, college athletes, high school kids, like, how does your level of play change how you present yourself on social media, how much you stand up for social issues? Because once you're in this business, you know what I'm saying? Like, it becomes a business. We've seen with Colin Kaepernick, like, that was probably a big stimulus to why I wrote it. It's like, you stand or kneel for what you believe in. And, you know, the next day you're out of, out of a job. Like how much is posting your true authentic views, thoughts worth the possible, you know, consequences. So it was just a senior thesis. I had to write a thesis and it was something obviously I was, you know, um, you know, a part of, but also, you know, very interested in. And so it came to be like October 15th, close to training camp towards the end of training camp. Might just like, Brooklyn Nets want to sign you to training camp. Oh my God is great. God is good all the time. I said, <laughs> I, said, I said, I was not trying to sit here on this camp and like, you know, nothing ever happened. Like I'm trying to be a professional basketball player, I'm trying to make it to the league. And so it was such a dope opportunity. I was at training camp with the Nets for three days at the end of camp. I could dress for the Toronto Raptor games. Uh, I mean, I'm in the gym with Kyrie. I'm in the gym with KD. Like, Obviously, I'm not really getting reps because they know they're going to cut me and take me to Long Island. But it's really just like the full circle moment. Six months ago, whatever, I leave Princeton, not knowing what's going to happen. Come up with the slogan, this lifestyle, run your own race. I'm like, look, I'm going back to campus to get my degree. And the, and the best opportunity for me would have been playing in Long Island. And shout out Matt Riccardi, who's now with the Dallas Mavericks in the front office. He was a big fan of mine when I went and worked out for those dudes during pre-draft. And, you know, he made it happen. Um, it was a super dope season for me in Long Island. But the biggest thing was I was able to, you know, twice a week, I'd have to go back down to campus, sit in class, talk with the professors, show them I'm present. I'm actively getting my degree. I'm, I'm literally in Long Island. There'll be times I'm on the bus, on the plane, writing this thesis. And I think the last assignment I turned in, was the day of a game. I had to turn it in at like 7 p.m. The game's at 7. I literally turned it in at 6.30. My teammates are in layup lines. And I'm on my laptop in the locker room. Submit. I was so lit. I said, I'm done. Came out, hit three threes in the first quarter. My boy's like, weren't you just on your laptop? You didn't even warm up today. I said, bro, I don't have to. I said, I'm no longer a school. I said, I'm no longer a student athlete. I'm a pro. So it was just, it was a dope, it was a dope experience. I think it was tough. I wish upon nobody. Uh, it's kind of ironic that two months later, everyone's getting their degree on online on Zoom. I mean, I had to, I'm here taking train rides, but it was such, again, a humbling experience. And it just shows like when you have your intention set on something, you know, much bigger, when you have specific goals. My goal was get a degree, play in the league. And I have these two things that are kind of happening at the same time. 2020 was definitely a time. And then obviously COVID hit, um, which put us all, I feel like more or less on a similar playing field where we had to be at home. 
obviously, you know, if you have higher means than the next person that looks different from in terms of just like how your living standards. But for me, it was just, I was at ma'am's house. This is a very full circle conversation. Ma'am was the hub, you know, I'm living in her basement, lifting weights. I started a literally like a zoom class for kids all over the country where I would just hop on zoom, send the link um, and do like a 30 minute ball handling session. They had kids from LA. Uh, this is awesome. Uh, one of my friends, nieces, Anna, uh, she was constantly on the zoom from Milwaukee people back from like New Jersey area. Um, and it was super dope. Like for me, it was like, I need to get better at ball handling. And right now nothing is guaranteed when we'll play again. My goal was to play in the NBA bubble. And I was like, I'm going to become one of the, the best ball handler I've ever been by doing these classes, you know, giving kids something to look forward to. Um, so it was dope. And obviously like from there, from there, it's just like, what's the next step look like? And at the time I didn't know, but I was trying to be ready for it. How do you, how do you, you know, how would you tell your younger self to kind of like deal with some of the uncertainty that goes with being a, a pro athlete, knowing what you know now? Mm. I would say, if I'm talking to my younger self, um, that, so things are going to get tough. Things are definitely not going to go as planned. Everyone makes plans, but at the end of the day, like God is the ultimate decision maker and he's going to know what's best for you. Even if at the time it doesn't feel like it's in your best interest. Um, when I was in fourth grade, I was playing for the number one, th number three, or defending national champion AAU team, Cincinnati Knights. Luke Kennard, as you all know, shooter for the Clippers, he was on the team. Uh, some really dope. Macy Oteague, who was, I don't think he was on the team yet. He played the following year, Baylor national champion. Um, this was like a bona fide AAU team, third graders. I remember watching these kids. I'm like, damn, like, kids are good. Like, geez, I'm not, I, I got to get better. But this team asked me to come to nationals with them. And so it's like, okay, like going out there, I was telling my mom, like, yo, my leg kind of hurts. I feel like I'm getting sick. Uh, and we're just like, yo, like this team is making sure that, you know, you're on this, on this roster. They just won a national championship in third grade nonetheless, but it's like, it's a great opportunity for you. I think it was like the second game there, go out for a layup. As I jump. My f I break my femur. Mm. Bone, the quote unquote strongest bone in your body. And it was a hairline fracture from playing on a trampoline a couple of weeks earlier. But I mean, you're sitting here in Des Moines, Iowa, and you go off a layup and now you snap your leg. Like, what do you do from that? Like, that was never in the plans. How do you tell a kid that's 10, 11 years old, like, everything's going to be okay? And so for me, the advice is when things don't go your way, um, when you're faced with some sort of setback or adversity, like what, what do you, who, what, who are you? Like, what is your why? Like, what kind of person do you want to be? And for me as a kid and to all the kids out there, it's like, if you want to be an NBA player, there's no reason why you can't be. If you want to be a doctor, there's no reason you can't be right. If you want to make varsity, there's, there's nothing holding you back. But you have to have this so, such a strong belief in yourself and you have to pair that with an equal amount of work. And so for me, it was like as a kid, I, I, I want to be healthy. Well, you're not going to just be healthy by not going to PT and doing what the physical therapists say. And I remember that physical therapy was probably harder than what I just did with my ankle. It's your femur. I, I remember my quad was so strong after that physical therapy, but it was like, I was like, I, I want to be healthy because I just, and at the time it was like, I just want to play basketball. And so I did everything I had to do just to play basketball. Just basketball. to get the most basic version of what you wanted, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Fast forward 15 years. It's like, I want to be back in the NBA, bust my ass every single day in rehab, like crying through rehab, trying to get an extra little millimeter of mobility in my ankle. Cause I'm like, I deserve to be in the NBA. I want to be in the NBA. Like, like God, I'm telling you what I want most in life. And I'm going to put an equal amount of work towards that. It's going to happen. It's not negotiable. Like it, it will happen. And it may not happen when I want it. And I remember writing down my goal. Like I want to be back playing by the, by training camp. I want to come back in training camp and show the magic. Like, Hey, I'm healthy. 
I don't need to be in the G League again. Like, let's go. Like, I'm, I'm right back. I didn't play until February 1st. So that's not my timing. That's not the timetable I set for myself. But God knew when it was time. Um, and so that's that's really the biggest advice. It's like, what is your why? What do you want most? Write that stuff down. Set goals. Work just as hard as that belief that you have for yourself. Um, and if you do that, good things will happen. Well, the caveat of that is, if you're going to work so hard at something, you might have to start cutting things out. I know everyone loves Fortnite. Got to cut it out. You know what I'm saying? For the adults, you probably love going out and getting drinks on the weekend. You want to look a little different? You want to shed a little bit of weight? Got to cut out the alcohol, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, these are just, these are things that you have to do. Like, you have to give something to get something that you've never had. You know what I'm saying? So, it, it is across the spectrum. I don't want to just talk to kids. I want to talk to everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like, because yeah. because on every step of this journey, and I'm sure it's going to happen for the next five, ten, my whole life. It's going to be things where it's like, damn, why is it not going my way right now? It's like, all right, bet it's my race. My my colleagues are getting the bonus. I'm not getting the bonus. I'm not going to envy them. It's like, damn, they actually probably put a little bit more work in. Oh, but it's politics, man. Like the politics are why they're getting it. Nah, bro. Like, <laughs> look in the mirror and, and and let's let's face each other and just say, okay, what can I do differently to get a result that I've never had? And so that's really the biggest thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, COVID happens. COVID's tough for everybody. What what component of your mindset did you come in with that, that felt the strongest? What part of RYOR or what part of everything that you've dealt with did you channel the most coming into that? 2021 G League bubble season that catapulted you into the, you know, life's full of peaks and valleys, but that was definitely a peak. Yeah. I think things started becoming very clear to me during uh, that quarantine that it was like, I'm, I'm, I'm basically putting myself in a position where I cannot fail. And it's like interesting to say, but it was like, I want this so bad. <laughs> like, like, it's the point was, like, scary. It's, like, people know it's, like, yo, he's not playing around. Like, he's not playing games. Yeah. Like, start doing things that you're, like, you're out of your body. And you're, like, I would never do this. Like, I wanted to play in the TBT bubble because I was, like, you know what? I deserve to be in the NBA bubble. So, I'm going to go to the TBT bubble. I'm going to ball out. Like I said I would back at Princeton. I'm going to ball out. And I'm going to get to the league. Like, it seems so simple. I was, like, it's that simple. Just ball and get signed to the NBA. It's pretty clear. Like, just do that and you should be good. So I get to the bubble and all my drives to the TBT bubble, I get a call from the Nets. I'm like, see, look, I didn't even have the ball out. I had already balled out. It's time. They're going to call me. I said, I'll just keep driving from Indiana to, to Florida. I'll drive straight to Disney World. I'll pull up to the bubble. We're good. And, I mean, this is public information. This isn't, like, a secretive conversation. Because clearly I wasn't in the NBA bubble. So we knew, we know <laughs> how the conversation went, but it was more so, it was more so the, the air in which I was in, the sentence that kind of took place. And it was like, we want a veteran. I've played zero NBA games. I'm a rookie, played 40 games in the G League. We want a veteran. A lot of guys are sitting out. You're definitely in the mix, um, but we're going to go the, the veteran route. And they were like, we're signing Jamal Crawford. We want to vet. I'm driving country roads. I'm talking about cornfield. Like I'm trying, I'm driving to Columbus through a bunch of nothing. And I'm, and I'm on a call where it was, Hey, we don't want to sign you. We like you, but we're going to sign Jamal Crawford instead. And I said, all right, like double down, triple down. Let's go to work because that your name was just in a conversation. A, a roster spot was between you, probably a lot of other people. They may have went another direction anyway, but it, it, the fact of the matter was, hey, I'm calling you because instead of you, we're signing a Hall of Famer. Arguably one of the best scorers of all time, right? Like, not even, I don't even think it's a guess. It just is. The best six man of all time. Yeah. The, the, probably the best hooper. I ask anybody who's a hooper, Jamal Crawford. He's still hooping to this day. Shout out Jamal Crawford. Shout out Jamal Crawford, the walking, talk, walking talking Crawford. bucket. Walking bucket, I mean, what he's done and, and is a part of in Seattle basketball. I spent last summer in Seattle as I was doing my rehab. Like what he has created, 
like Seattle needs an NBA team and Jamal Crawford needs to be a, a part. Of, you know, he, need, he needs to be in management because it's amazing. So at the time it's like, okay, like, what are we, what are we saying right now? Like me or you? Yeah. Okay. I said, yeah. Si- yeah. Sign Jamal Crawford. Like, what are we talking about, dude? Like, okay. Like, trust me, I'm going to go put some work in and come next season, be ready to ball. I don't know what the season is going to look like. Cause we're still talking about quarantine COVID. But to that point, it's like, all right, I'm still going to ball out in the TPT. Uh, I get there. We do our COVID test. This is probably the first live sporting event since, you know, COVID hit. One of our teammates tests positive. Our team gets, our team gets eliminated before we can even play. Um, and so you ask, what's the mindset? Like, what was my mindset going into that 2021 season? And it was like, control the controllables. Like, whether you get signed, get picked up, sign an Exhibit 10, whether there is a season, you control the controllables. And literally the phrase, run your own race, Devin Kennedy. Like, what are you doing from here? Don't worry about the, the guys that are in the bubble that you know you are better than and that you belong in the bubble. Don't worry about them. They're doing their thing. Go do yours. So I went out to L.A. I locked in, basically was training at Mamba Sports Academy up in Thousand Oaks. Um, found myself training with two of the probably the the best basketball players the game has. Um, it's, you can go and research. It, it, it's to that point where it's like it was a special, and and, and you're, you're in the midst of these guys who you're, you're hanging with and you're battling with and earning mutual respect from. And at that point, as I was controlling the controllables, it was also, yeah, you really belong. So whatever happens going into this, don't doubt yourself. Go get it. And that's really what I did. Signed, obviously, the Exhibit 10 training camp with Orlando. Got my first bucket on an NBA court during training camp. Waved me. They're like, hey, there's this NBA bubble, or excuse me, the G League bubble taking place down in Disney World. And I literally wrote to my trainer. He's like, yo, I hear you're going to the bubble. What's, what are your goals? And I literally put bubble MVP. At the time, I thought it was going to be the full, and I, I wanted the whole thing. I wanted the, the season MVP. Paul Reed got that. But I beat Paul Reed in the championship and got finals MVP. So it's like, you know, it works in mysterious ways. You ask for something, you get something maybe just as good, if not better. So I was just locked in, and it was just one of those things. I had a conversation with um, our trainer, Hasid, our assistant GM at the time, Tunji, and it was like God puts the right people in the right places in the right time for you when you're living right, when you have the right intentions. Um, and that was kind of my brain trust because that was not easy being in a bubble away from home, playing games, having games where you're not playing great. You're not getting the right minutes. It's a limited season. You're like, yo, if I don't ball out and get to the league from here, do I got to go overseas during a pandemic? Like what a 16 game season is not a season, but I really, I really took advantage of it. Uh, stayed consistent and obviously like that mindset of just like knowing your worth, knowing like, Hey, I belong um, in controlling what I could control led me to be in the MVP of that game, winning a championship and then getting ready to get signed for NBA contract when I signed the 10 day. Yeah. Can we, uh, can we just give a quick shout out to Hasib because God bless that man. He's, he's always around something positive, you know, it's just what he does. That's fact. Hasib the goat. We got to make a hoodie. We have to make a run on race hoodie just for Just for a one-on-one for a Steve. Love that, man. Um, so going back to the race, right? Your race. You come off of the finals MVP. You're riding high. But just like Kobe said, job's not finished. The NBA season's still going on. The transition to Orlando. What's, um aside from, like, just getting ticks in a regular season NBA game, having a double-digit NBA game, which I'm sure, you know, you, you'll get into, but what is that experience like? And what is, what is something from that experience that nobody could prepare you for? <clears throat> Here's the crazy thing. Being out on the floor, warming up, first game was against the Wizards. So I get signed to the 10 day. I was like, bro, this was my dream. Like you talk about, what would you say to the kid? Like I, I I'm, imagining being that kid I was that kid wearing a Tracy McGrady jersey like wearing a magic jersey 
going to games, going to the Bulls games with my dad. I remember going to the Chicago Bulls Magic game in Chicago, Jameer, Dwight. So then you, you put yourself back in these positions. It's like you saw it. Like you were in the stands, and now you are about to run out of this tunnel onto an NBA floor. Like, come on, bro. you can't make this shit up. You know what I'm saying? Like me, of all people, like look at me. <laughs> No one said I was supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be here. That's the thing. They don't think I'm supposed to be here. They probably think it's a fluke. Like, uh, well, just got lucky. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah, he could shoot. Like, of course he was going to make it. Like, bro, you never believed I was going to make it. <laughs> so, like, let's not act like you thought this was supposed to happen. Right? But I I remember just being that kid, and I'm, I'm literally looking at the kids, looking over the freaking thing. You know what I'm saying? The tunnel. And so it's like, I won't go a day running out there where I'm not looking, looking back, saying hi, like, no matter how high you get, however low things get, like these kids come out here. Like I was that kid. And so as I run out on this floor and you got Bradley Beal and Russell Westbrook shooting, it's like, bro, we're here. It wasn't a feeling of like extreme excitement. It was like surreal. I remember it was just sitting there and like, okay, we're here. Granted, not a lot of fans because of COVID, but I'm still out there. And it, it was back to that mindset. Like I belong, but this shit is still crazy. I like guess still crazy nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. Even even regardless of COVID, if it's COVID fans p- protocol attendance, like the lights are still bright and the cameras are still rolling. You know, it's it, it can't like I don't think there's any way that you can like describe that to somebody who doesn't play in the league. No, so I checked in and my heart rate was high. It was very high. Like, I felt it. I was like, coming, I was like, okay, I, I, if I shoot the ball right now, it's, it's over the backboard. <laughs> um, so that was like when I checked in it was like I'm actually getting into an NBA game not just acting like a, my player who's a 60 overall just looking down the bench you know like I was on the bench for 46 and a half minutes of the game sitting here like the my player just looking around I'm pressing I'm like get in the game get in the game <laughs> but it never happened right and then a hey, coach looks at the score he's like Devin get in <laughs> rip the pants off like, I'm, let's go um Remember, I picked up a foul, did something just to get my, my jitters out, got a steal. They were in the bonus, you know, ran into the dude. He fouled me, got my two free throws, hit my first two NBA points. And was just like, you know what? This was it. Break the ice. But, like, now it's time to capitalize on the opportunity. This is a 10-day contract. This isn't like, yo, all, everyone talks about, you're in the NBA, you're getting bread, you're famous. This is, you have 10 days to do what you do at the highest level. Otherwise, it is not guaranteed that you will ever get another opportunity. Like there's, there's dudes that I think in like, you can look in the record books, probably this season, you know, with all the COVID call-ups, it's like the, the harsh reality is you're not, you don't just get another opportunity. Like God willing, you, you find yourself in a situation to where opportunity arises. Like, that's what I pray for, you know, that I continue to do the work and that an opportunity is there for me, but it's not guaranteed, right? So as I, you know, was was back in the hotel, talking to my sister on FaceTime, kind of kind of nonchalant and calm, and she's like, why are you not jumping up and down? Like, you just played in the NBA. Like, she's like, why does it act like you didn't even play a game today? I was like, because I got a game in two days and I only got eight days left on this contract and I got to make the most of it. Um, so with that, and, and the cool thing is like about this mindset and like how I really approached a lot of things, especially this 10 day was like, don't put too much pressure on yourself. Like if this is the only 10 days you get, make the most of it, like really take advantage of this, like enjoy it. And I did, and I really did. I mean, I was, I played well. Uh, I think during the 10 day, I had enough moments where it was like, we need to see more of this guy. And that's when they converted it to a two-way, which basically it's not an official 15-man roster spot, but because the NBA has added these two additional roster spots that can kind of go back and forth between the NBA and the G League, it basically gave me a spot where, hey, we're going to rock with him for the rest of the season. So that was more security where it was like, at least I'll get at the time was like 20 more games, which is a lot of games, um, which obviously we know – ends with an injury but the game before that was like that was when I was in the most flow state I think of my contract and my time with them was okay like we're here 
the game before that, I was like one for eight. I had two air balls against Atlanta Hawks in Atlanta. It was like my first game getting first quarter minutes. It was that time during the season. Um, and I, that's when I put a lot of pressure on myself. It was like, oh, this isn't just get in and get up a shot and, you know, do like you have to help us compete to win a game like from the jump. You know, we're going up against Trey Young and, and Lou Williams. They're like, don't foul Lou Williams on three. He's a vet. He's sneaky. Come over the screen guard and boom, foul three. I look over Coach Clifford's like this guy. I'm like, I, I, there's my, I'm done. Like, they literally said, don't do that. <laughs> so I was really questioning myself then. It was like, okay, this isn't just, this isn't just a, a 10 day snippet of being in the league. Like, you're getting real opportunity. Like, you're getting evaluated. Uh, and the, I went back to work that, that next day at practice. I was really locked in on just like, shooting and, and trying to do all the little things right. And one of the coaches comes up to me and is like, yo, you're here for a reason. Like you shoot, you shoot the ball. Like you play the game the right way. Like don't put so much pressure on yourself out there trying to make it just play that very next game. I, I me and Mo Bamba lead the team in scoring with 17 super efficient was just, was just ball. was just playing the game. Um, and that was kind of the switch that was like, just do that. Like next game against the Pacers, had my family down, brought my family down to Orlando, flew them in so they could see their son, their brother play in an NBA game. Like what's been my dream my whole life. I'm feeling good from the last performance. Second possession up and down the floor. Go up to block the shot. What am I doing blocking shots? I don't know. Do I want to take it back? At At the time, I probably would have. Now everything happens for a reason. You know, it was a blessing in disguise, like the amount of growth I've had since then. But you go up to block the shot, you're just playing the game, you come down. And if I heard a noise. I just heard a noise. I'm like, that's, that's not normal. I was like, did this dude just jack his shit up? Like, I'm like, I don't, you, you don't get hurt. Like, I'm not supposed to get hurt. You know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen to you. It doesn't happen to people you know like that. Definitely nothing serious, but I heard it. Next thing I know, without even wanting to, I'm yelling, like screaming. I didn't look down, but then I started feeling pressure around my leg. I thought it was like an actual like leg bone instead of the actual ankle. And then I'm like, all right, yep. there goes our season. Like, there it is. I don't know what this is. I think I just broke my leg. So I lean back. I didn't even know Mo Bamba threw his jersey over me. I look up and he has his jersey off. I'm like, what the what the hell is happening right now? Like Mo Bamba doesn't have a jersey on. I hear celery breaking. I'm laying on my back. I just scream, what is happening? So obviously, lo and behold, open ankle dislocation without a fracture, which is like one of the most rare things to ever happen. Your skin oh. breaks open, your ankle just dislocates, but no bones broke. Like that's God. Um, you know, I don't know if it's good or bad how it happened, but I mean, at the time it's like, all right, I don't know what this next step looks like. We talk about running your own race. I don't, I don't know where this race goes next. Like I have no clue. I've never had to face this at this level when it's a cutthroat business. You just got an opportunity. You showed you can play clearly. You just had 17, you know, you're doing the right things. There's still a lot of question marks around you. Can you defend? Or, you know, are, you're, you're short for a, a, a two guard, but you're not nearly a point guard. There's a lot of question marks. And then you have a nasty injury, probably the, one of the worst injuries of that NBA season, for real. I mean, like Nurkic reached out, Dennis Schroeder reached out. Like you got guys that watch League Pass, you know what I'm saying? Like they're probably like, damn, that was nasty. It's, a, it's an undrafted dude that never really had a, an opportunity before then. Nah, you're probably not going to get another one. A lot of people probably counted me out in that moment saying like, yeah, you know, that's career, NBA career ending. You know, probably play overseas. Like people are thinking these things. People probably in my own camp, people who, you know, seven, eight, nine months later are back. Say, hey, man, you know, good to see you. Like it's like, all right, but you, you yeah, you thought I was going to be in Croatia. You know what I'm saying? Like, but yeah, at that moment, didn't know what the next step was going to be, but got through it and kept persevering. And I kept these same principles about me. Yeah, I think the uh, the last year has been a direct result of the principles, right? Everything that you've done, whether it's the clothing line, whether it's the court, 
whether it's the partnership side, it's all been based on like those ethos, those principles, those foundational points. The last year has been a whirlwind and it, and it got capped off with you getting back into the league. What's the, like the sense of vindication? What's like the, what's the feeling? What are the words? Are there any words, right? For, for coming back and not just coming back to the G not just coming back and playing like one NBA game, but coming back and signing the paperwork. <sighs> Man. It's hard to say. It's hard to say because this past year has been filled with a lot of different emotions. Like from that moment to a week later, getting, getting waved. I remember laying on the couch, foot elevated, on painkillers, like, I, like can't wiggle my toes. And my agent calls me, he's like, hey, it's kind of protocol, you know, you're obviously injured. They really like you, but they're going to waive you to sign someone else. It's like, you know, it's the business, but at the same time that like you're a human being, and that shit hurts. <laughs> like not just your ankle, like your pride, like you're like, then you start questioning, you start doubting, like, man, like, am I going to be back? Like, Am I going to be the same player? Like you're, you're, you're asking yourself these things. And so I just remember, like, from that moment to three months in, trying to, you know, I was literally a Seattle Storm practice player three months after dislocating my ankle. Like, shout out, shout out Katie Lou, shout out the Storm, shout out Sue Bird, last season Sue. Last season yeah, no Sue. Stewie. Stewie. I mean, that whole crew, like, I probably, was putting myself in grave danger trying to play. But I was like, it's like, no, nah, like I'm I'm good. You know what I'm saying? Like I had my stuff braced up. I was probably my mechanics were probably so bad. Like had I still been a part of the organization and they had a control of what was happening. Had I brought mentioned, muttered the question, like, hey, can I practice? No, there's no chance. Like sit down and Wiggle your toes. Like, basically, like, don't – you're not supposed to do anything. But I'm out here trying to play full court pickup. It was just crazy. Like, and so I feel like that was more so the feeling of, like, hope. Like, that was me, like, being, like, I'm hopeful. Like, I – you know what I'm saying? I wishful almost. Like, I wish or hope that I – so I wish, I hope, therefore, I am. You know, like, I want to be healthy. So I'm healthy, you know what I'm saying? And I'm acting as if I was when in reality, I was six months away from playing. So, I mean, I remember those feelings, the first feeling of walking outside of a boot again, um, you know, being present for, at my girlfriend at the time, Katie Lou Samuelson in her season and, and kind of compartmentalizing my injury and all of those emotions that I was going through getting waved and, and figuring out what's next. Uh, but being there for someone you care so much about and and being present for her games and the struggles that she's going through and how she's running her own race. And she wouldn't mind me saying this, it being her third team in three years and her head coach got fired and she's has a new coach. She's playing with two of the greatest women's basketball players of all time. She's starting. She gets put on the bench. She comes back. Like, she needs her own episode. She'll get her own episode. <laughs> she will. It's going to be uh, Katie Lou tells all. The, yeah. the, the, the saga. The saga. The saga. The saga. So I'm sitting here, you know, part of her journey, you know, you know, trying to uplift her, be positive for her. She's in turn uplifting, being positive for me. So I remember all these feelings of love, of, you know what I'm saying? Like these, these, this um, hair, you know what I'm saying? Like all of these, these good feelings that you have when, when you know you found somebody at the time, like I said, girlfriend, but as she gets ready to go overseas and I'm now in what I would say is like the third of my fourth stage before I get to back playing, I'm like, that's my wife, right? This is, I, I'm still six months from an injury and I just confirmed I found my wife like that was another feeling of just like a lot is going on <laughs> a lot is happening right now you know what I'm saying and, and I think a big part of that too settling sitting down you know God kind of sat me down and said hey you've been on this this journey 
you're strong enough. I pray every day before before games. You know, I Lord, you know, thank you. Let me be a light of the world, salt of your earth. I pray no one gets injured. Everyone gets out here safe from harm. And so in that moment, I'm kind of taking it back a little bit. When I got injured, instead of cursing, instead of being like, why? I don't know how I had the presence of mind, but I was just like, Lord, I don't know why this is happening. Like I'm in my brain as I'm trying to breathe, Lord, I don't know why this is happening, but thank you for blessing me with it. Because I so clearly I asked, like, I don't want anyone to get hurt, but let me be a light. You're obviously using me in a way that I can't even comprehend. So thank you. Like whatever, wherever you're about to take me along this journey, take me. But you know, I still want to be in the NBA. Like, like let's understand. We we have we have terms of the deal, at least on my end. Like I, I want to be back. Like I don't just want to be a motivational speaker. Like I want to get I want to play on the court because I feel like I have the ability to to motivate and inspire through my words, but my actions and and only gonna help if I'm back in the league. Like, you know this. Come on, man. Like, yeah. So that's what I'm thinking. But, but as I was saying, like, I, I feel like I really had the time to sit down, kind of uh, take stock in, in my life outside of basketball. And, and a big part of that was Katie Lou, right? And it was like, you know, I'm not just doing this now for, like I said, my sibling, my parents. Like, I have a person that I want to share the rest of my life with who I want to, you know, be in this this fight with and, and fight for. And so as I as I get healthy, it's not just me, it's her, it's, it's our future family. These are things that I'm thinking of and it's like really motivating. And it's like, I mean, like I said, I was with her running her race, I'm running mine. It's like, we could be one running our own race together. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's that's what I see. Like, that's the vision I have. Like, no, no days off. Like, there's no setbacks. Like, you're gonna go get this done. But at the same time, I'm sitting here planning an engagement. Like, I'm, I'm planning to propose. And you know this, I'm sitting here talking to you like, bro, I have no time. I'm like busting my, you know, as every day to get healthy and to get back playing. But she has three days that she's home when she gets back from Spain. And I want to put something together. Not no dinner, put it in a little glass of champagne. She, oh, look, there's a group ring in here. No, like I want to put together a freaking engagement to show her not just like my level of commitment, but like I can be fun. You know what I'm saying? Like this is a moment. I want, I'm, I'm a big, I'm big on moments and not just spending money or spending you know on things but it's like an experience and i'm gonna tell you three days after i came back playing my first game in the g league which was a dope awesome moment hitting my first bucket hitting my first three i took which was the preparation from the moment i got injured nine months later to a t playing again i was ready for that and was like look i'm about to drop on a knee two days later and propose the love of my life. Like, this is, you talk about God's timing. Like, he knows what's up. He knows what's up. And that was really that. And obviously, like, you can you can list, like, the stats if you want to from the G League season. But I was prepared. I was focused. I had a really, really good year percentage-wise. Like, I was I was locked in because I was on a mission. I was like, I'm going to get back by the end of the season. Shout out to the Orlando Magic organization for believing me, not just on the 10-day, but, you know, playing well on the 10 day, having just this utmost, utmost faith in myself to just go out there and just be who I am. I really felt like I did. I felt like I defended. I felt like I shot the ball well. I just played the game how I know how to play it with fun, with passion and shooting the thing. Right. End up shooting 40 percent on the 10 day. But then they converted it to a multi-year contract. And I remember calling you just like yelling let's go like just yelling like let's go just constantly over and over again let's go because it's like even though it's non-guaranteed like i said this whole journey has been non-guaranteed like tomorrow is not guaranteed you know what i'm saying like so so for anyone to say oh it's a non-guaranteed contract what does that mean this is a non-guaranteed life okay so like tomorrow's not given right so like let's not act like it is so when I when God blesses me by waking me up tomorrow and I'm still on my non-guaranteed contract, but I have a locker in the magic facility and I have a parking spot in the magic facility and I'm living the dream that I had been living for the past 26 years, it's not guaranteed. All right. <laughs> like, well, watch, watch me make this thing guaranteed because that, that's just, that's the energy. That's, that's how I feel. And, and just that commitment from them saying, look, 
the ball's really in your court. And it may happen to where the roster shapes out to where I'm the odd man out and I, you know what I'm saying, they have to move on from me. Like, I'm going to leave no stone unturned um, because I've been through too much. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've experienced basketball at the professional level, level here in the States at every single level. Training camp with no money in Brooklyn. That's an Exhibit 9. I didn't even know I was signing an Exhibit 9. I thought I was going to get a 50K bonus. I didn't. I don't know if it's negligence on my part or a lack of communication the other way. Either way, I wasn't even worried about 50K then. I was so locked in that I'm, I have this ability to play professional basketball, get my degree. And you know what I'm saying? Like, it's God's timing. My whole point is that's really you're, you're playing. You're on a G League contract. So I was on a G League contract my first year. Next year, training camp, got the 50K bonus. Boom. That's the next ring. Check it off. Okay. Went to the bubble. Did your thing. Well, you got to get a 10-day, 10-day, check. What's the next step? Probably a two-way. Guess what I got? A two-way, check. Damn, injured. Back to training camp. So I went two, two. Okay, back to the back to, back to there. Now I went up to the 10-day. And at this point, it's like they blessed me with the two years. And that is an official 15-man roster spot. There's 450 roster spots in the National Basketball Association. And they said, Here's one of them. Like that's that's the journey, man. That's running your own race. And like, I have never summed this my life story up. There's probably so much more left untold. Like, but but from start to finish, hitting on uh, the majority of the key pieces, the key themes and elements that brought me and us to this moment on this podcast, talking to you guys. It's, it's a big, big full circle. And, and the best part about it is like, that's ca- encapsulating just a small snippet of just like, like you said, the principles that have gotten me here. But I'm excited for what's next and what's to come. Because the things that I have written down on this board right here, right next to me, that says training campus in 42 days and the goals that are written down and the plan that's laid out it's, it's special. It's really special. And so I'm excited to share more. I'm excited, Malad, the manager, for you to, to be along this journey with me. Uh, I think the guests that we're going to have on here in the future, in the near future, uh, you know, as long as we do this podcast, are going to have their own unique stories, uh, not just basketball, baseball, football, soccer, business, life motherhood like literally anything that you can think of you name it we will try and have a guest on that will touch on that an author whoever wrote a book i'm sure there's people out here that have awesome stories they just don't know how to start the, the book writing process i mean there's gonna be so tiktok like you name it i mean we always said that you were the every man and everybody else is in one way or another they're an every man or an every woman right they're all running their own race we're going to tell those stories. We're going to show people and we're going to share with people other people's blueprints so their dreams could be feasible because everybody deserves to have a race to run and everybody deserves to have a dream to chase. So I'm excited as well. I can't believe we're finally here after months and months and months of pushing. But let's go run our own race. Let's go have, our, let's go have a good time. Let's go empower other people. Let's go motivate and inspire other people. And this is only the prelude. Episode one on the way. Check it. We're going to edit this part out. <laughs> I, I, let's keep that part in. <laughs>